All right, I hope uh, y'all will be able to make it back tonight and, and join us in, that, uh, in the study. We've been having a, a, a time studying the, some of the more interesting passages. I find them very interesting passages, passages that aren't typically looked at. A lot of times when you're reading through a, a text, teach, teaching it or, or uh, walking someone through it, some, so there are passages there that we just skip over sometimes because, well, they're just kind of hard to understand. And those are the passages we're going to dig into. And so uh, I'm hoping you'll uh, join me tonight as uh, we uh, continue our study called Weird Stuff in the Bible. Um, so that, that'll start at, uh, at, is it 5 o'clock? I think so. 5, 5.30? It's 5. 5 o'clock. Read your bulletin, just, just to be sure. <laughs> I, I read it earlier. Actually, I wrote most of it. And uh, I don't know. It's, that's the way the memory's going these days. Our series for this morning and for several Sunday mornings this summer, we're talking about God's design for family. I'm calling it a family fire. Thinking about passing faith from one generation to the next. Last week, we discussed that as being God's design for the family. When he created a family unit, he, had, he was doing so with intention. It wasn't just a matter of, of uh, filling the earth with each species, especially when it comes to the human species. There was something more intentional, more deliberate in what God was doing when he put Adam and Eve in the garden and when he gave them the instructions uh, to, to do the things that they did, to eat of what they were to eat of, uh, to uh, have the relationship that they shared. And we're going to come back to the passage that, that Robin read here in just a minute. Last week, we, we discussed this idea again of, of family being God's design, being God's creation, and he made it for the purpose of passing faith from one generation to the next, creating this family fire, a fire that, that allows faith as that fire to sweep through the eons of time and into generations well into the future. And we all play a role in that. I believe that parents contribute significantly to the growth or decline of the next generation. And if we are just complacent in just kind of letting each day roll by without intentionality, then we may miss opportunities that are before us to, to observe and to demonstrate God's design for family. We learn that parents, if they're to be intentional about this, they realize that this just doesn't happen. Again, it's something that they've got to plan for. And that planning starts well before the nursery gets decorated, right? It starts actually even before someone gets married. That intentionality in terms of being what, having a family that is what God wants it to be, that meets God's design and purpose for family. That starts before we get married. Let's think about purpose for just a minute. How many of you ever had a Swiss Army knife? Have you ever had one of those? All right, they, they're kind of cool because, again, they've got multiple purposes. Uh, they've got a small blade and a large blade. They've got scissors. I use the large blade in mine uh, quite a bit. Mostly, and I don't know what you guys use your pocket knives for, but mostly I use mine for opening packaging, cutting strings, cutting plastic, and that kind of thing. And what's the other use we have for, guys? Cleaning your fingernails, that's exactly right. And it's, actually, I could use that right now, so I'm gonna. But um, yeah, that's, that's what a pocket knife is used for. This particular one, though, also has a toothpick, which is kind of cool. Toothpicks are designed to remove food particulates from in between the teeth, right? And that's what we typically use them for. It's why we, we, uh, we have them as handy. I uh, won't ask uh, Dale and Mike what they feel about a toothpick that gets used over and over again and shared, you know, between different people. They're probably not happy about that. But I'm guessing they're happier with that than they are with people who think that the blade of your pocket knife is a toothpick. I mean, have you guys ever seen, like, disaster stories, injuries that happen when, when people use a pocket knife as a toothpick? I'm guessing that happens once in a while. Uh, and I, I remember my mom just hitting the roof when I used her steak knife as a, as a toothpick one time. Uh, she really wasn't a fan of that, and uh, I don't think just for reasons of possible injuries to myself or my brothers. Uh, but that was, that was something that happened. And we realize that, that when we think about things like that, that it, when we take things outside of their design parameters, we run a risk, all right? 
Use a toothpick to clean your fingernails and that baby breaks off under there, then you're going to have to get a pocket knife to get it out, right? <laughs> Anybody ever use your cell phone for a hammer? <laughs> All right, not very long, <laughs> right? <laughs> How about using a folding chair for a ladder? Have you done that? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, sometimes that works out, sometimes it doesn't, and when it doesn't, it's usually pretty ugly. It's usually a trip to the hospital. We want to try to use things for what they were designed for. The same goes with marriage and family. When we engage in anything that God created and put down here for us, we want to think first, what was it, what's in its intended purposes? What did God put that here for? And then if we're seeking to serve him, if we're seeking to be what he wants us to be, we're going to observe his design for what those things were meant to be. Marriage is one of those, one of those things. When we think in terms of, of marriage, let's go on to that next slide. We think in terms of marriage, God designed marriage to make people one. In the, the passage that, uh, that was read by, by Robin, God says, and that's why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and the two will become one, one flesh. The two becoming one. Interesting statement there, thinking in terms of what that means. And again, you could probably do a sermon series. I've seen sermon series on oneness and what that, what that means in, in marriage and how that relates to relationships, human relationships. Talk about it being body, mind, and spirit, right? The body's pretty easy. Body's becoming one. That's, a, that's an easy one to figure out. The mind's becoming one, well, that's a little more difficult. The spirit becoming one, that's a mystery even well into the marriage relationship. What does it look like when that happens? And yet God says that's what it is to happen. God looked down on the earth and saw that the man was alone. He needed a, a partner. He needed someone with which he could propagate his species and fill the earth with it. He needed someone to hold him accountable and to help him to remember his creator, to remember the purpose for which they're together. And God created Eve. And he said, for this, for this reason, the reason being that woman came from man and they were created for each other. For this reason, a man is to leave his parents and be united to his wife. In other words, those two create an entirely different family unit. And again, remember last week we talked about the fact those family units had intentionality, had purpose, had design. They were designed to be this couple who would have children one day, and then those children would come to know God through their parents. And they would also be taught through their parents to teach their kids to know God, They're passing that faith from one generation to the next to the next. And he said, the two shall become one flesh, that oneness, mutual identity, rooted in a relationship with God, and then passed on to your children. When a man and a wife, when a man and, and a woman come together and become man and wife, they take on that similar, that, that identical identity. They're no longer separate. They're, they're one. They, they, have, they share a, a last name in most cases. They, they share a, a place to live, uh, and they share that oneness. A lot of times when they go out and they introduce each other, they're introducing each other as my other half or my better half in some situations. And because of that, again, because of that situation of marriage, they are one and they're looked at as one. The family unit also, the children that are in that family are looked at as one and share those elements as they come together to achieve oneness. But think about this. Why is the whole oneness thing so important in marriage? And I'm gonna, this, this is a, there's a challenging answer to that. The answer I think is the right answer is a challenging answer to that. Why is the oneness thing so important in marriage when people come together? Because it's difficult. Let that sink in for a minute. Because coming together, taking two separate identities, taking two people who in their basic nature, their basic human nature anyway, are selfish. They're thinking about themselves and what I want. And then putting them together and saying, now you all are one. You gotta do things together. You gotta live together. You gotta have this, this, this uh, way of life together, possibly even this, this family with children. You've gotta do that all together. In fact, I'm gonna 
I'm going to install a covenant here where you all take on this covenant in my name and before me, and, and I'm going to say that if I put it together, you, you got to leave it alone. You don't take it apart. You got to stay. Even when the going gets tough. And for everyone I've ever talked to who've been married, the going at some point does indeed get tough. It's difficult. Putting two people together and requiring them to become, to be unselfish people is difficult. If you go to that next slide. And yet God says, I know it's hard, but I want you to stay together. I want you to to continue in that togetherness, in that oneness. What that takes, I want you to think about this a minute. What that takes when we become one, and this, is, this is, applies to, to those who, who are married, those who are thinking about getting married, regardless of how long maybe that, that you've been married. But the fact is, is that oneness requires giving up me for the sake of us. Giving up me for the sake of us. That's really unselfishness at its essence, at its elemental parts. Unselfishness, giving up me for the sake of us. Some people ask me as a marriage counselor sometimes, what is the biggest problem that I see in marriage? And there's, the answer to that is really kind of a no-brainer. The, the, biggest, marriage that, the biggest problem that you see in marriage is, un, is selfishness. It's when I want my way and she wants her way and we're just not going to put the two together. There's no give. We're going to entrench on both sides of those, those wishes and there's going to be no give in these situations. When that happens, then the chasm between the husband and the wife begins to widen and it doesn't go away. And it's all, as long as we let those things, those, those non-negotiables, those things we aren't going to give on, continue to get in the way, the chasm will continue to grow wider and wider and wider, leading to what we have in our nation right now, and that is a a significant rate of divorce. Uh, The statistics still stand at about one in every two marriages. That that does include uh, second, third, and fourth marriages and that kind of a thing. If you just look at first marriages, it looks a little better. But the fact is, is that a lot of people who put that relationship together, who take that vow before God to stay together, don't. And it's because of this in most cases. One in in one reason or for one reason or another, selfishness rears its head, and that's what happens to the relationship. It takes the relationship down. It's important that we remember that when we make this commitment, that we make it before God. And that we make it with the intention of staying together. And that's the, that's the important part. Now, again, because of our human weakness, it doesn't always happen. I know there are, are, are folks in our fellowship this morning that have experienced divorce and have had to, to go through that, that process. But I also know that, that for most of you, that wasn't what you wanted when you first started out. That wasn't where you wanted it to go. And due to things, some within your control, but probably a lot outside of your control, Things didn't go that way. And that happened. Again, God's grace is there and he forgives us. But I think you would join me in in encouraging those who are married or those who are going to get married or those who are looking to be married someday to look at marriage as something that is a forever kind of thing. Not forever, but for life. That's another sermon. It's it's for life. It's It's something that we do for life and we intend for it to be for life. That we are to stay together despite the fact that it's difficult. Have people come in and say, you know, hey, th- I, this is harder than I thought. This is, this is more difficult. And I, and I would say to that, that's marriage. That's, that's not only a, a side effect of marriage, that's the point when it comes to this idea of oneness, that God created it to be difficult. When he made us and he made us as human and that flesh pulls us to want our own way to give that up is not human. That's spiritual. To seek to give that up says, I'm, I'm dedicating that to God because this just isn't the way I wanted it to go. And so I give it to God. I give that up and become a part of a team, a part of a twosome, part of oneness so that we can become one. And that's what it's all about. It's not a new problem. 
In Malachi chapter 2, uh, the, the uh, author of the, of the prophet, the minor prophet who authored the book, Malachi, is talking to the post-exilic Jews, those who have come back from exile, and talking to them about some of the problems that have, that have cropped up or, or, or become evident since they came back from exile. And in verse 13 of Malachi chapter 2, he says, here's another thing you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, weeping and groaning because he pays no attention to your offerings and, who, and, and doesn't accept them with pleasure. You cry out, why does the Lord not accept my worship? I'll tell you why. Because the Lord witnessed the vows you and your wife made when you were young, but you have been unfaithful to her. Though she remained your faithful partner, the wife of your marriage vows. Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and in spirit, you are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. So guard your heart. Remain loyal to the wife of your youth. I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. To divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So guard your heart and do not be unfaithful to your wife. That's the New Living Version. In that, God shows us the reason, his intention for marriage and what he wanted out of that. In the, to the culture that he was writing in, he's writing to the men because divorce was the sole decision of the man in those days. The woman had no, no right or no opinion on that whatsoever. It was just the man. And if he decided that the marriage was over, she had no say in it. It was just, it was, it was him saying, hey, I'm done with you. And you can imagine in that culture, the temptation would be for men to say, hey, I found another model, so I'm going to send you off. And that's apparently what was going on there liking someone a little better. And so he decides the old model is going to go away and the new model is going to come on. God says, that's not what I've done. In other words, I'm going to take the easier route. I'm going to go with the one that I, I may not know as well, but I know this one's, I know the, the old one's flaws and, and that kind of a thing are just getting old to me, so she's got to go away. And I'm going to take on this new one. And God says, when you do that, you're covering your whole situation with violence. You might as well take her out because that's exactly what you're doing in this situation. And that's why God says, I hate divorce. Don't do that. Don't break faith with the wife of your youth. I mean, the fact is, is in marriage, it brings out the flaws in all of us. You may be able to hide your flaws and weaknesses from your spouse for a short time, but you're not gonna hide it from her forever. They're gonna know where you fall short. They're going to know where you fail and where you fall down, where you take a step back. Even if you're someone that's looked up to and highly respected in your community, your wife or your husband is going to look at you and say, yeah, but I know a few things. Right? Even the saint, most saintly among us has a spouse that they've managed to annoy and frustrate along the way somewhere. Right? Because that's the nature of marriage. That's what marriage, that's what happens in marriage. Why? Because it was made that way. When we're selfish, those kind of things are going to come out. When we're selfish, those kinds of things manifest themselves. And we have to overcome that. We have to push through that, through prayer, through dedication to God, through spiritual guidance from counselors. We have to push through that kind of thing to become the kind of people that God wants us to be and to have the kind of relationship that God wants us to have. Let me say this to several different groups of you out there. If you're single this, this morning and, and looking to get married maybe somewhere down the road, maybe that's something that's coming up for you. That's something that you're looking towards. I've got, I've got one son who's married, he's made his, his life partner choice uh, and we thought that was a great choice. We, uh, we love Carissa and, and uh, have uh, a lot of uh, expectations for their family to continue to do this thing that we're talking about. And uh, looking forward to grandkids one of these days if you guys are watching online. The, uh, the, uh, because I know that they're going to be the kind of family that passes faith in, in their generation. Got two daughters that are, that are looking. And what we've encouraged them to do is to think about this while they're looking. To look from among those people that they date to think about dating someone who's going to get this job done. 
If your job when you're married is discipling your children, why would you marry someone who couldn't care less about that? That's an important point. If your objective in getting married according to God's design is to disciple your children and pass your faith from one generation to the next, why would you marry someone who couldn't care less about that? It doesn't make any sense. And I have people coming to me fairly often saying, well, I'm interested in it, but my husband isn't, or I'm interested in it, but my wife really isn't. I ask you to, if you're single this morning, think about that now. Think about what that future is gonna look like. Choose from among those people that you're going to date someone who will be just as committed and just as dedicated towards leading your children to know Christ and passing your faith from one generation to the next as you are. Someone at least as interested as you are. And that's gonna help you to get this job done. That's gonna help you to encourage your children in their walk of faith, to encourage them to be what God wants them to be. To those who are married, we have, I'm gonna divide you into two groups. To those who, of you who would call yourselves happily married, things are going pretty well right now, and to those who would say, well, our marriage is struggling somewhat. And again, all marriages are struggling in here and there. That, that's, again, that's the point, right? We're all gonna struggle here and there. But there are some who, because of personality types, because of healthy family out upbringing, because of decisions that they've made, counseling that they've got, have been able to work through some of those struggles and put some of those things behind them to where their struggles are not, don't feel relationship threatening anymore. All right, that's a good way to define a happy, someone who's happily married. Our struggles don't make us fear that we're gonna break up at some point in time. Our struggles don't make us fear that, we're gonna, that one of us is gonna hit the point to where we say, I'm done. Those are, those are happily married. If that's the case, and if you're in one of those marriages, God bless you. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that you've been able to work through that, and I think you would agree that it's because of his blessings and because he's walked you and helped you through that and helped you to get to the place to where you are today. Continue to work through times of trouble. Don't put those in the background. When trouble raises its head, deal with it. Work with it. Work through it. Don't let difficulties camp in your marriage. Attack them because they're from the enemy. Attack them and work through them. Allow God to draw you through them to increase your faith in him as, as he pulls you through and to increase your dedication to one another. That's the idea. Faith grows in the tough times. And as we go through those, those tough times that all of us do, those times when we don't get along, those things that we have disagreements on, when we go through those, our faith grows because we've done it with prayer and because God's helped us through. And our, and our, our bond tightens, strengthens because of, of what God's doing through that. That's how we stay a happily married couple. Next week, we're gonna talk a little bit about dealing with times of unhappiness. The, the title for next week's lesson is The Key to Happiness in Marriage is How You Deal with Unhappiness in Marriage. So I want you to hope you'll come back and listen to that, talk a little bit about how to deal with conflict. To those of you who may be struggling right now, to where you've got struggles that come up that are there on a daily basis and you feel like those struggles might be relationship threatening, that, that's a, you feel like your marriage is kind of on shaky ground right now. Let me encourage you to continue doing this. First of all, to see that the difficulties in your marriage are very, very normal. In fact, oneness that you're, the oneness that you're seeking will only come through times of difficulty. And so if you're in one of those times of difficulty right now, then good things can still come of that as you work through it and as you strive to be the people that God wants you to be. It could be that you, you need some tools. It could be that you need to overcome some of the some some damage or, or difficulty that's taken place in your past. It could be that you need to learn how to deal with do conflict resolution in a in a more effective way. All of those things are doable, but it's important that you remember that in God's eyes you're one and that you stay together. Don't entertain the concept of divorce. 
At least don't entertain it until you come and talk to, to me or someone like me. Try the counseling route. Try talking to professionals. Try a marriage mentoring, someone who can go through uh, and, and, and walk with you through some of the difficulties that you're facing right now. But don't, don't put things away. Don't, don't turn away from, from God's plan for you just because you can't seem to get through some of the difficult times because there is help out there and we can get you through. The last group I want to talk to is to those of you who, who are divorced, have been divorced, are single parents right now, and you're, and you're working through this. There's a lot of material out there, and I think very encouraging material, on how to, to be a, a single parent and yet raise Christian kids enable, as you're enabled to pass your faith from one generation to the next. I think anyone who's a single parent would, would agree that that's more difficult, being a single parent. It's, it's, it's more difficult. Or if you're a parent that is having to do it on their own, whether you're single or not, it's more difficult that way. And yet it's doable. One of the best pieces of advice I've seen out there is asking those who are in that boat to identify, uh, to, to have a team. A team of Christians that are on board with you, that are working with you to help disciple your kids. Whether it's kind of people who are grandparents, obviously can be fantastic in that. If you're a grandparent this morning and you have you have kids and and or kids who have grand who have kids and, and they're your grandkids, you have time, you have an opportunity there to disciple them as well, to spend time with them, and to be sharing your faith with them and continuing that faith passing thing. In fact, I think the one of the strongest. Uh, uh, predictors of whether kids will retain their faith is not just having parents who are Christians, but having grandparents who are Christians as well. That's a great thing. And if you're a Christian grandparent, I want to encourage you to engage, to be about helping to disciple your grandkids and to move them in the direction of what God wants them to be. But if you're, like I said, if you're a single parent or if you feel like this, the passing faith is something you're having to do alone, even if you're not single, put together a team. Put together people, whether it's your, your parents or whether it's people here at church that can join with you, spending time with your kids, helping them to know that God wants them to be disciples as well, can sometimes be a very powerful and effective tool. And I would certainly encourage you to do that. Let's go to that last slide. Some of you may have read this book called Sacred Marriage, written by a guy named Gary Thomas. Uh, the tagline in the, in the title of the book, what if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy, is one that really resonated with me. I think a lot of times that we, as we enter this concept of marriage, as we enter marriage, we think that it's about our happiness, having that someone who is, who is going to be there for us, having that partner that's going to be there for life, we can grow old together and that kind of a thing. And I'm, I'm not saying that's a bad goal at all. I think that's fantastic. And I want that for any of you who are married or who are going to be married. But as we've already mentioned, marriage, even at its best, is fraught with difficulties. It's bound to have rough spots along the way. And so it's important for us to realize that the rough spots are not just part of the periphery of marriage. It's actually part of the point. Because as God is, is working in and through us to improve us and to make us better, he wants us, he needs for us to work with each other to become more and more holy. To hold each other accountable, to sanction one another towards and in the direction of holiness. Not trying to change them to be what I want them to be, but trying to change them to be what God wants them to be. And it's important that I give my wife license in my life to lead me closer to the Lord. And that I give, and that she gives me license in her life to lead her closer to the Lord. It's always difficult to hear criticism. It's always difficult to hear someone say, well, maybe you shouldn't have done that. None of us like to hear that. None of us want to go in that direction. But the fact is, is that when we do hear it, it's something that's precious. It's something that's part of of the point of why God made us one. It's important that we realize that point. And it's important that we engage that process, thinking in terms of holiness even before happiness. Because I promise as we work towards holiness and righteousness, happiness is a product of that. 
Happiness is rarely a product of me just getting my way. And that's an important distinction. My parents are great examples of this. They, neither one of them were raised in Christian families. They were raised in homes, in fact, both of them were raised in homes where alcohol abuse, physical abuse, and that kind of thing had its impact. Neither of them went to church regularly, if at all. My dad had one spiritual influence in his life. It was his paternal grandmother, who was a very spiritual woman, and who shared her faith with, with her kids and grandkids on a regular basis. And my dad remembers, I think I've told some of you all before, my dad remembers going and visiting her, and she had one of those old oil lamps lit and was reading her Bible by that old oil lamp, and she would invite them to come and sit at her feet as she read the Bible to them and then explain to them what it meant. They didn't have any other spiritual influence in their lives, and all of them, all seven of them, are Christians now. And I, I think that's a pretty amazing tribute to what a grandparent, she had no idea that her influence was going to do that, to what a grandparent can do. And yet, as a young man, again, dad not having a lot of spiritual guidance and mom not having a lot of spiritual guidance as a young woman, they were married, had children soon after they were married. And there's no doubt, I think they would, they would be very open to admit that those early years had some difficulties. Both of them, again, coming from a, a fairly unhealthy family background. There's a lot of love, but, again, a lot of trauma, too. Both of them coming into that relationship by the books, if you look at it by the, the marriage counseling books, you would look, it would look like a marriage that's going to start off in trouble and probably only get worse. But then God intervened. God reached down to them and, and through, the, through the impacts and influences of several people, brought them to the Lord, and the Lord changed them in their, in, their marriage li in their married life. And they began to dedicate their lives not to what they wanted, but to what he wanted. And the predictable happens. My brothers are, are all Christians. Their kids are Christians. And the, that, that fire is rolling through our family now. And it's our, our desire, our commitment, our dedication to keep that fire going through our family and to keep our faith being passed from one generation to the next because that's what God would will it to be. Next week we're going to talk a little more about, about marriage and again a keys to a happy marriage and what that looks like. But I want us just to remember this morning those words. What if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? In our study of scripture and in our, in our realization of what God has intended for marriage, I don't think any of us should be surprised to find that marriage can be tough. To find that, that difficulty is the path to holiness and that holiness is the path to oneness and that oneness positions us to pass our faith along to our kids. That starts way back. That starts as a young person, the choices that you make then in who you date and in who you marry. That starts early in marriage, of being intentional towards helping each other to be more holy, to being more of what God wants us to be, with the objective that once God gives us children, whether it's children born the natural way or foster care or adoption or other kinds of, of mentoring, something along those lines, as God gives us those children and grandchildren, it's our objective to use our faith that has been, that has been purified in this, in this uh, crucible of marriage taking away our impurities and being more and more of what God wants us to be to help to disciple them. It positions us. The oneness we achieve positions us to help our children to come to know God, to be joined in faith, to make their choices for godly spouses and to pass their faith to the next generation, teaching them the same thing to pass their faith to the next generation. That's what this is about. And I hope we can embrace that and, and, and uh, grasp that as we continue this series of Family Fire. This morning, if you're a Christian and, and would like to, to dedicate your life to the things, to godly things, to things that God wants you to do, then we invite you to do that this morning. We're going to have people around the room uh, in the, and in our foyer lobby area back there who would be more than happy to pray with you. Whatever your request you might have, to pray with you that, that, that God help you with whatever in your life or help somebody that you know in their life, 
The, the content of those prayers will remain confidential unless you state otherwise. If you'd like us to, to bring that before the church, we can do that. But you'll have to tell us, otherwise it remains confidential. This morning, if you would like to put on Jesus in baptism, if you would like to make him your Lord, engaging him in this process of, of, of sanctification, of righteousness by faith, and of growing in that faith to be more and more of what God wants you to be, he invites you to do that as well. His grace is there for you, and his grace is sufficient. Whatever your needs are this morning, we're going to sing this song to encourage you to respond however you need to and to let us know what your needs are this morning. Let's stand as we sing this song.
Jesus.